Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 476th episode, we're continuing our two-part series on ichnofossils. Also known as trace fossils. Also known as footprints, coprolites, a bunch of other stuff the dinosaurs left behind. Mm -hmm. But in this episode, specifically, we're going into burrows, eggs, tooth marks, coprolites, and there is a fun fact, mm -hmm. which I know nothing about. But it's related. <laughs> it's loosely related to coprolites. I'll give you that hint. Okay. Is it some other kind of bromolite? Like a regurgitolite? Kind of. Hmm. Okay. And we have dinosaur of the day, Behariosaurus. But before we get into all of that, as always, we like to thank some of our patrons who help us create special content like this where we don't have to worry about algorithms so much. And this week, we'd like to thank Tarkia Tamer, Eric, Trent Carbajal, Brooke, Adilosaurus, Ryan, Professor Herrerasaurus, and Kyla Solis, Darren and Miss Olive, and Sammy Saurus. Yes, thank you so much. It's so fun to work on these more in-depth episodes, and we learn a lot along the way. So we appreciate you and everybody in our Dino It All community. Jumping in to the ichnofossils, we're back to talk about all the traces that dinosaurs left behind. And in part one of this two-part episode, we mostly focused on tracks, but it's not just about footprints, even though they do tell us a lot about dinosaur behavior and their lives in general. There's also, like Garrett mentioned at the beginning of the show, burrows, which tell us how they lived, if they lived alone or in groups, eggs that tell us how they reproduced, tooth marks that tell us how they ate, and of course the fossilized poop and vomit, which also tell us how and what they ate. Starting with burrows, burrows and nests can tell us a lot about whether an animal lived alone in communities and in some cases, if they had advanced levels of social orgs, known as eusocial behavior. It's hard to tell from a burrow alone what animal made it, but there's a few details that can help give us clues, like the size of the burrow, if there's claw marks on the burrow, maybe there's gnaw marks on some plants that are found nearby, and also just the shape of the burrow. The best thing, though, of course, is if there's a body fossil found in the burrow, <laughs> like the case with Erectodromaeus, the most well-known burrowing dinosaur. It's the first non-avian dinosaur that's known, that we know of, that burrowed or was published about. We talked about it back in episode two. The full name, Erectodromaeus cubicularis, means digging runner of the lair. So the genus name Erectodromius is Digging Runner, and then that species name? is of the lair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's very descriptive. It was named in 2007 by David Vericchio and others, and it was found in Montana in the U.S. in the Blackleaf Formation. It lived in the Cretaceous. They found an adult and two juveniles in a burrow, and the body fossils support that it was digging and running. It's a bit more specialized the fossils than animals today that do that, like rabbits and hyenas. It had a broad snout, which was good for digging. The adult was nearly seven feet. It was 6.9 feet or 2.1 meters long and weighed about 50 to 70 pounds or 22 to 32 kilograms. And the juveniles were about 4.3 feet or 1.3 meters long. Oh, still pretty big. Yes. Based on the large size of the juveniles, it probably took care of its young, and it probably took care of its young for a while. Mm -hmm. They were found in a burrow about 6.6 .6 feet or 2 meters long and 2.3 feet or 70 centimeters wide. That burrow is similar in size to the adult Erectodromaeus, which is another sign that it was probably the one that dug that burrow. It makes sense. It'd be weird if one of the babies chucked the burrow, especially because a lot of animals dig burrows in order to lay eggs and mm -hmm. then protect the young. So kind of needs to be the adult digging the burrow. I think the thinking was that it wasn't another animal that dug the burrow. Oh, that's true. But even if it was, a lot of times burrows are repurposed by other animals. Mm -hmm. And you could still consider them burrowing animals, even if they don't actually do the burrowing themselves. <laughs> they still live underground in burrows. You know, it's sort of semantics about whether or not. That's true. But with Erythrodromaeus, we do think it could dig. 
This burrow was densely packed, so the three of them probably died in the burrow. And the burrow is similar to burrows that hyenas and puffins make. In 2019, L.J. Krumenacher and others described two new Erichthydromaeus burrows. These were found in the Wayan Formation. One burrow had an adult skeleton preserved with the forelimb, hind limb, and tail. And it seems that they might have gotten preserved in burrow fills. The burrow got filled in with material. Seems like the optimal way to get preserved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> already underground, and then it just fills in on top of you so nothing can scavenge or anything like that. And burrows are a decent place in terms of water content too. Yeah. So yeah, it does seem like a, a likely situation to get fossilized in. Plus it tells us a little bit about the behavior. So it's like, thanks, Erichthydromaeus. That's mm -hmm. very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for dying in your burrow. <laughs> wow. Silver linings. Yeah. Erichthydromaeus isn't the only burrowing dinosaur. In 2020, Yu Ching Yang and others named a new burrowing dinosaur, Chang Mianya, that was found in the Liaoning province in China. I think when I described that one, with, when it was a new dinosaur, I said Chang Mianya, just because of my Midwestern accent. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, Chang Mianya or Chang Mianya lived in the early Cretaceous. The genus name means eternal sleep. They found two nearly complete articulated skeletons, and there were no signs of these skeletons being preyed on. One individual was curled up with its tail projecting out. The other was mostly straight, and as you described it, the first time Garrett in kind of a flattened leapfrog position. Mm -hmm. Based on the arms and skull, it was probably a facultative digger like Erichthydromaeus. Unfortunately, we don't have too much information about where exactly they were found because they were collected and prepared by local farmers, but... We do think that the two individuals were resting in a burrow that collapsed and preserved them perfectly, possibly from a mudslide from a nearby volcano. That part is speculation, though. Finding a, and I think you said this the first time, finding a natural cast of a burrow would really help. So, almost as good as Erichthydromaeus. Yeah. <laughs> There's another dinosaur that potentially burrowed, Thessalosaurus. Or Thescalosaurus. Or Thescalosaurus. We'll see which way I end up pronouncing most. <laughs> <laughs> this study was in 2023 by David Button and Lindsay Zano. Now, Thescalosaurus is a small neo-ornithischian dinosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous and what is now North America. It was bipedal, so walked on two legs. We know it from several partial skeletons and skulls. It grew to between 8.2 to 13.1 feet, or 2.5 to 4 meters long on average. It had sturdy hind limbs, small wide hands, and a head with a long pointed snout, and it was an herbivore. For this study, they did a CT scan of the skull of Willow, a specimen at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, which makes sense, because Lindsay Zana was involved. Mm-hmm. Now, Willow is about 12 feet or 3.6 meters long and weighed about 750 pounds or 340 kilograms. That sounds really big for something that burrows until I was talking to someone. I can't remember if I was on the podcast or not. And they were saying, but bears burrow. Mm -hmm. And then when you think about that, you're like, okay, yeah, some pretty big things do burrow. Also with dinosaurs, we often talk about a lot of their length is in their tail. Yeah. So hopefully it's flexible enough that they can turn around because otherwise they'd be a little awkward in a burrow. Mm -hmm. You have to reverse out, I guess. So with the CT scan, they reconstructed soft tissues in the skull, like the brain and inner ear. And they found that the hearing range of Thescalosaurus was limited. It could hear about 15% of what we humans can detect and 4 to 7% of what dogs and cats can hear. So and it's bad at hearing high-pitched sounds. Hmm. So it heard low frequencies best, and the range it could hear overlaps with Tyrannosaurus rex. They also found the Thessalosaurus had a great sense of smell. It had these well-developed olfactory bulbs, which were relatively larger than other dinosaurs we know of so far, and similar to living alligators. So maybe it used its smell to find buried plants like roots and tubers. It also had very good balance, which is another trait found in burrowing animals, and it had powerful arms and legs. They made a 3D digital reconstruction of the brain. It had a relatively small brain. And there's trace fossils and skeletal evidence of earlier Thescalosaurids that burrowed, though we don't have any fossilized tunnels or, quote, other corroborating ichnological evidence, end quote. <laughs> 
This is published in Scientific Reports. So it's unclear just how much of a burrower the Celosaurus was. Trace fossils would definitely help. And I know I said this is an episode about trace fossils, but how could I not include another potential burrowing dinosaur? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's the thing about trace fossils. They tell you about the behavior of the animals and then it branches out into, well, what other types of animals might create these trace fossils? Then you know where to look for them and what you might expect from different animals. Exactly. I feel like Thescalosaurus is one that we almost never talk about. <laughs> it's not like a household name, even though it is a pretty interesting group of dinosaurs, or the Thescalosaurids are a pretty interesting group from the latest Cretaceous, so they coexisted with a lot of the most popular dinosaurs. But maybe it's because they're a little bit smaller. Like you said, they only got up to about 13 feet long. Well, as the authors put it, this is a neglected dinosaur. Yeah, but they do look, I mean, in general, if you looked at one, You'd be forgiven for thinking it looked kind of like a hadrosaur mm. because it's bipedal. It has decent arms on it, but it's, you know, they're clearly short enough that it was bipedal. And presumably, I think it was a herbivore. Yeah, it was. And we've known about it for over 100 years. So <laughs> when it was first discovered, it was a big deal because its name means marvelous lizard. Maybe we'll be marveling at it again soon. That's interesting. I, di I didn't remember that that's what the name meant. <laughs> it's pretty grandiose for a dinosaur that everybody forgets about. Mm. We'll talk more about trace fossils starting with eggs in a moment, but first a quick break for our sponsors. Moving on from burrows to eggs, they seemed like it was a natural transition. Mm -hmm. Sometimes eggs are considered to be trace fossils unless they're embryos. Because eggs provide direct evidence of reproductive behavior. Yeah, it's interesting because I remember yesterday you were saying the trace fossil definition was basically something that wasn't part of the animal. And eggs are almost part of an animal, right? Because the mother dinosaur lays the egg. So mm -hmm. it like, is something that their body created. But I guess things that they create and leave behind are a gray area. Because like a tooth isn't an ichnofossil. The shed tooth isn't an ichnofossil, I don't think. But tooth marks are. Yeah, tooth marks are, and then like egg shell fragments aren't as soon as they're disassociated with the animal. I'm not sure what, because I know there's been a couple of cases of dinosaurs' body fossils found with eggs in them. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where that, how you would categorize that. I think that would not count too, because that's sort of like a bromolite or regurgitolite or mm. ga do they call it a gastrolite? I can't remember what it's called when the coprolite is still inside the body. Oh, I see. Oh, was that a cololite? Cololite, yeah. Yeah. So in that case, that, that would probably be an ichnofossil because I think all of those are classified as ichnofossils. There's a lot of gray area though, obviously. Mm -hmm. There's a quick note too, speaking of gray area, sometimes eggs are more than just eggs. For example, a Ching He and others named a new type of dinosaur egg in 2022 based partly on one that was found that was full of crystals. Hmm. So it was partially broken and filled with clusters of calcite crystals, and it looks like a geode. It's very pretty. Yeah. That can happen with bones, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you've got those opalized fossils, and things can be multiple things. Things can be multiple things. <laughs> <laughs> Quote of the day. <laughs> anyway. Eggs can tell us about behaviors like brooding. For example, there was a study in 2023 by Mattia Tagliavento and others that found that Troodon could change its body temperature and likely brooded its eggs and nests shared with other female Troodon. Hmm. We talked about this one in our dinosauroid episode. I don't remember talking about that. Yeah, that's why I thought it was worth mentioning again because the dinosauroid, I think, Stole the spotlight of that episode. <laughs> the like humanoid creature that hypothetically on a very fringe hypothesis could have evolved from Troodon if it hadn't gone extinct. From Stenonicosaurus. Which, is that a Troodontid? Yes, it is a Troodontid, which is why we talked about it in that episode. So <laughs> dinosaurs evolving into birds meant that there were a lot of changes, including in body temperature and reproducing and nesting. And Troodon helps show some of these changes. The team studied bird eggs from chickens, sparrows, wrens, emus, kiwis, cassowaries, and ostriches, as well as reptile eggs from turtles, crocodiles, and alligators, and compared them to Troodon eggshells. And we know that they're Troodon eggshells because of embryos found with the eggs. So 
embryos are very helpful, having those body fossils. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're from the Oldman Formation. They used dual clumped isotope thermometry, which is a way to measure and reconstruct body temperatures of dinosaurs, and they compared eggshell mineralization processes. With most dinosaurs, we think they laid their eggs in mass and incubated them like reptiles by covering their nests. But there's some derived theropods, like oviraptorids, that seem to have brooded their eggs, though we don't know for sure if they used their body heat to incubate them. And we think that they were nests similar to birds, but they had two functional oviducts like reptiles, whereas birds only have one. And it turns out Troodon had some reptile and bird-like characteristics. I feel like we're going to get emails because sometimes people consider Troodon to be Stenonychosaurus, so, or that they're synonyms. So I guess this camp is in team Troodon is its own genus and is valid and is not just Stenonychosaurus. Yes. I feel like we've been hearing teasers for a while that there's some paper or some something out there that will show Troodon is valid. I think we've kind of already seen it, and it's mostly just papers like this where they say it's Troodon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I do occasionally hear people say like, I don't really buy the whole Troodon being valid because the holotype is just teeth. Mm. Well, we'll keep an eye out. But back to the brooding. So in birds, the team found that bird eggs mineralize much faster and more effectively than reptiles, and they can tell this by patterns in the eggshells. And again, birds only have one functioning ovary. In troodon, the patterns in the eggshells show that the troodon eggs mineralize more like reptiles, more slowly. So it seems that troodon had two functional ovaries based on the eggshells being more like a reptile's. Knowing that the eggs mineralize more like reptiles makes it easier to estimate the number of eggs that an individual troodon would lay. Based on previous studies, troodon weighed about 50 kilograms or 110 pounds, and the egg was 50 to 60 grams or roughly 2 ounces of calcite. Based on that information, a single troodon could have a clutch size of 4 to 6 eggs. This helps support the hypothesis that troodon nests, which had up to 24 eggs, were communal. And there were four to six females laying their eggs together. Modern birds like ostriches also have communal nests with two to seven eggs per nest. But because the patterns of troodon eggshells are similar to reptiles, that implies that their, quote, isotopic composition directly reflects eggshell formation temperature and thus body temperature, end quote which means you can tell the body temperature of troodon based on the eggshell formation temperature. Now, of the four troodon eggshells in this study, three were estimated to be about 42 degrees Celsius, which is about 107 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's similar to modern birds' body temperatures. Because troodon was so warm, maybe it partly incubated the eggs with its own body heat, or brooded. The fourth eggshell was colder at about 29 degrees Celsius, which is about 84 degrees Fahrenheit, the colder temperature was similar to temperatures in previous studies of oviraptorids, and that helps show that troodon was heterothermic. The body temperature varied with the environment. It was, quote, capable of voluntarily reducing its metabolic rate like modern birds, end quote. So this may have been key to eventually leading to true endothermy, or being able to generate its own body heat. That's a lot that we learned from some eggshells. So are you saying that this sort of paleothermometer technique of the isotopic composition of the eggs tells us about the brooding temperature of troodon or the body temperature of troodon when it laid the eggs? The study is saying that the eggshell temperature relates or reflects the body temperature. So yes, the eggshell temperature, the same as the body temperature. So it seems crazy that the body temperature would vary by over 30 degrees Fahrenheit. But I guess that's what they're saying. I think what's happening here is torpor. So in other words, they're lowering their body temperature to save energy. And maybe one of those eggs was made while it was in the low energy state. I don't know the details, but hummingbirds can drop their body temperatures between 23 to 37 degrees Celsius. <laughs> that is a lot. That's even more than this. Yes. Other birds can do it, not as extreme, but pigeons do like 3 to 10 degrees Celsius. Does seem handy. Mm -hmm. While you're resting, drop the body temperature, save some energy. Yeah. But anyway, like I was saying, the eggshells, they told us 
a little bit about the temperature of not just the eggs, but the dinosaurs that laid them, as well as how big these nests were and gave us hints that these nests might have been communal. Yeah, that part's really interesting that they could estimate the total number of eggs that an individual might be able to lay and then say like, there's no way just one troodon could lay all these eggs. Mm -hmm. Must be a community laying the eggs. All from little fragments. <laughs> eggs can also tell us about a dinosaur's lifestyle. For example, a study in 2021 by Lea Stefano and others found that based on eggshells, titanosaurs probably lived a nomadic lifestyle. They studied the isotopes of eggshells and they estimated a body temperature based on those of about 40 degrees Celsius or about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And the eggshells came from three nesting sites in Argentina. And they said that titanosaurs, or at least the females, probably had stable high body temperatures. The isotopes they found in their study were also consistent with other studies from around the world. And based on these studies, it means titanosaurs created and laid eggshells in similar conditions around the world, though they didn't always live there the whole year. But they did need specific conditions to reproduce. So having high body temperatures would mean that the titanosaurs would eat lots of food, and then likely they were nomadic. They would have had to move around to get all that food. The nests were dense in some sites, so they may have come back to the same sites every year to breed, and the nests were in an arid area. It possible that the titanosaurs had to fast to reach their nests and they would fast just long enough to get to the nesting site because they probably didn't stay with the eggs after laying them well that's interesting yeah yes yeah, so getting lifestyle tips or <laughs> lifestyle hints yeah i guess the main thing there is seeing that they were nesting in the same spot over and over and over again meant that they lived there some of the time as in lived physically were there mm -hmm. but like you were saying they needed to eat so much that there's no way they could just nest there all the time and eat there all the time they would have had to spread out a little bit more for food yeah and then there are egg pathologies couldn't resist including some pathologies here <laughs> that can tell us more about dinosaur reproductive behavior as harsha demon and others found in their 2022 study they found this pathologic egg a titanosaur egg from the late Cretaceous found in India, and it was specifically an ovum in ovo. Oh, yeah. The one egg within another egg. So there's two yolks. You remember this story? I remember ovum in ovo. I was thinking that was the one where there were multiple layers on one eggshell, but I think that is a different name because that's when it's like egg bound. Yes. Ooh, I'm blanking on that name though. But this one's an egg within an egg. It's been found in birds, but not in non-avian dinosaurs until that study. And in the picture, you see the two eggshell layers, like one layer over the other with a gap in between. Oh, there's a gap. Yeah. It, yeah. The one I was thinking of doesn't have a gap. They said that the gap between the eggshell layers may have had a yolk before fossilization. The way it's preserved, it looks different from turtle, gecko, dinosaur and bird multi-shelled eggs found, which didn't have a gap between layers. In birds, ovum and ovo happens when an egg gets pushed back up the oviduct through muscle contractions, and it meets another unshelled egg. The two eggs then move down to the glands that produce the shell and get encased in a second shell layer. That seems really painful, having an egg go back up the wrong way, like that far into the oviduct. Yeah, and then kind of melds into another one. <laughs> yeah, because that means it's getting extra big too. Mm-hmm. If the next ovulation cycle already happened, that first egg that went back up the oviduct gets new layers of membrane and maybe yolk, depending on which part of the oviduct it goes back to. There's a lot of possibilities for why this happened. It could be due to sickness, overcrowding, so there was more competition for space and food, or if there wasn't enough food, it could have been floods, droughts, environmental stress, or maybe a lack of suitable substances to build the nest, or climate change. However, since only one egg in the whole nest had a pathology, the author said it seemed likely that it was an individual problem, possibly could be, quote, attributed to an old or incapacitated individual following injury or sickness or one that underwent significant stress due to jump scare caused by a nearby predator, Oh, quote. it got scared and it startled the egg back up into its oviduct? Could be. <laughs> oh, man. Or it was sick or it was injured. 
It's nice to know that it actually laid it because some of these cases we were talking about, it ended up being fatal for the dinosaur. Mm -hmm. So it was fossilized with that egg inside it. But at least in this case, we know that it got it out because it's in a nest with other normal looking eggs. Yeah. So it makes me feel sorry for that dinosaur. Yeah, the egg problems do sound rough. You know what also sounds rough? Tooth marks. <laughs> I guess it depends what the tooth marks are on. <laughs> if they're on like tree bark. Yep, but we're not talking about tree bark. <laughs> <laughs> so marks in bone, they can be from claws, but also, of course, from teeth. There can be punctures, grooves, fractures, and they can tell us about both predators and prey. In 2023, Roberto Lay and others studied bite and tooth marks on sauropods from the Morris Information in the U.S. This was published in Pier J. The tooth traces look different depending on what the biting animal was doing, they found. You can see, for example, elongated traces from dragging teeth. Or if there was a collapsing bone surface, that means that there was a strong bite. Sometimes you can tell how big the carnivore was based on tooth marks by looking at parallel traces left by a single bite. Oh, yeah. So in other words, the, the traces of the serrations, I think, is a common one, mm -hmm. or the spacing between the teeth themselves. Yes, though it's still really hard to figure out exactly which animal left those tooth marks. Yeah, unless it's... I feel like the one case where it's pretty easy is with T-Rex mm -hmm. because it's like nothing else around their head of tooth that big. True. <laughs> so if you see this hole that's like, you know, a golf ball sized hole we were talking about in a recent episode, then it's like, okay, that was probably a T-Rex. Ouch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, tooth marks on bones help show the ecology. For example, if there's a lot of tooth marks on a particular herbivorous animal type, that could mean that that animal was a popular prey animal. It is hard to tell from tooth marks if an animal was hunted or scavenged. Yes. Sometimes you can tell if an animal was hunted because there are marks and also evidence of healing. Oh, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. I had thought of it as, oh, you can tell that the animal survived this, so it was like an unsuccessful fight of some sort. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a predator biting onto an herbivorous animal, odds are it is a failed hunt in that situation. Yeah. And not just like a, if they happen to stumble across each other and then, <laughs> you know, get into a battle. That could happen. It seems more unlikely, though. Yeah, it seems like either, say you have a Triceratops and a T-Rex, either the T-Rex is going to flee when it sees the Triceratops or it's going to try to eat it. It's not going to like just spar with it for a little while just because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I doubt any dinosaurs just fought for fun. Yeah. So again, the team studied tooth marks from bones from the Morrison formation, which means sauropods. Because hmm. <laughs> Morrison's known for its large sauropods like Camarasaurus, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, or Apatosaurus, and Brachiosaurus. There were also a lot of large theropods in the Morrison too, like Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, and Torvosaurus. Large there is like, they're on a different scale. <laughs> well, it is the Jurassic. <laughs> yeah, those are some really big sauropods compared <laughs> to those predators. They could still do damage though. That's true. Oh yeah, and the sauropods of course were juveniles at some point and would have been smaller than some of the predators. Or some of them could have been sick. Mm-hmm. So the team studied bones from 40 sauropod individuals. There were 68 tooth-marked elements. The theropod teeth were worn down probably from eating sauropods. Oh, jeez. They found there was more tooth-on-bone contact than previously thought. But they think that the theropods probably scavenged the large sauropods in most cases and then probably hunted and ate juvenile sauropods more often than adults. Some examples of the tooth-type marks include drag, from the teeth dragging. There's the bite and drag, which has damaged bone cortex. There's a pit. There's no dragging, but the cortex is intact. And there's puncture marks. They found tooth marks on the pelvis, legs, arms, feet, spine, chest, and tail from Camarasaurus, Gallimopus, and other sauropods. And on one bone, one bone alone had up to 48 tooth traces. Ooh, that must have been a tasty one. Mm -hmm. Or a hungry dinosaur. Or both. 
about 50% of the tooth marks were drags, and then 45% were bite and drags. And based on the drag marks, the carnivore probably moved its head backwards to eat the flesh, which a lot of large theropods did based on their neck movements. The teeth did contact bone. It wasn't that common, so it seems like it was an accidental thing rather than biting the bone on purpose like tyrannosaurs did. There's no evidence of bone gnawing. But this helps show that bite marks are not rare compared to areas with tyrannosaurs. It's still really hard to know which carnivorous dinosaurs made those tooth marks, though. That could be partly why it's easier to tell the tyrannosaur bite marks, too, because they're more intentional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's a much larger contact area with the tooth that you could like model yeah. or like sculpt, whereas in this case, they're just like little incidental pokes here and there. Or maybe more bone breakage. Mm -hmm. Though a few sauropod bones were bitten through or off, that means some of the theropods did have strong bites. They didn't find any evidence of healing in any of the bites either which means the theropods either scavenged or successfully hunted these sauropods. Yeah, I guess that's the biggest piece, right? If none of them healed, then that either means it's a 100% success rate for hunting, which on a large sauropod seems like no way. Mm -hmm. So then, yeah, their hypothesis of they're probably scavenging makes a lot of sense. It does. So the study's cool. It helps show that it's not just the bone-crushing tyrannosaurs that left tooth marks on bones. Because now we also know there's the Morrison theropods, and they're from the late Jurassic way earlier. That's where most people's favorite sauropods are from, so. Mm-hmm, including mine. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing, if your favorite sauropod got chewed on, but. Oh. It's interesting. Circle of life. It was tough to be a dinosaur. We'll get into the next phase of life, I guess. We go from eating to pooping <laughs> in a moment but first a quick break for our sponsors now you called it the next phase of life but maybe coprolites are the next phase of digestion <laughs> oh yes so we'll get into the next phase of digestion we've gone from tooth marks and eating to you know what happens to that food after mm -hmm. <laughs> so the part that we've all been waiting for maybe <laughs> it's fossilized poop, also known as coprolites. William Buckland coined the term coprolite. The word means dung stone. He liked coprolites and what they could tell us about the past. He once compared them with animal feces to show the origin of bone cave deposits in Yorkshire. He fed a spotted hyena ox bones and then the next day compared the nod bones to the coprolites and found no difference between them except in their age. Wow. Buckland liked coprolites so much, he had a table made with inlaid coprolites. It's now at the Lyme Regis Philpot Museum in England, and it's called Buckland's Dinosaur Poo Table. <laughs> Buckland's Dinosaur Poo Table. <laughs> <laughs> yep, catchy. <laughs> the coprolites look like beetles, so they've been called beetle stones. Just like in their overall shape and size? Yes. And they think he probably collected them from Edinburgh in... 1834. Buckland's son Francis wrote in 1867 about this, quote, table in his drawing room that was made entirely with coprolites and which was often much admired by persons who had not the least idea of what they were looking at, end quote. <laughs> They're very pretty. They have all sorts of different colors depending on the chemistry of what the animal was eating mm -hmm. and different patterns based on, you know, how it got mixed around in the guts. Yeah, we've heard of People making jewelry out of coprolites. They're very popular pieces of rock for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about coprolites, especially dinosaur coprolites, we have to bring up Karen Chin because she is the expert on coprolites. We interviewed her back in episode 256, and she filled us in on a lot of interesting details, like most coprolites are found from carnivores because there's a higher concentration of phosphorus, which is a mineral found in bones. There's also calcium. Coprolite can also preserve fragile specimens like tiny teeth or maybe very small organisms like brine shrimp and animal bones. Sometimes you can tell if an animal was an herbivore because there's plant material or seeds found. Now, the poop is partially decomposed plants, so that's kind of the beginning of a compost pile, I think is how you put it one time, Garrett. Mm-hmm. And that also sort of means not as likely to fossilize because compost doesn't usually stick around very long. 
true. In 2017, Harman, Sankusar, and others studied sauropod coprolites from India, and they found pollen, spores, algae, fungus, grass, diatoms, and amoebae in it. They think that the sauropods ate the soft parts of gymnosperms, like conifers, cycads, and ginkgos, and the soft parts of angiosperms, like flowers and fruits, and that the amoeba, algae, there was also some bits of sponge, and diatom remains came from drinking them in water. Those are some really small. Diatoms are tiny, and also amoeba, Mm -hmm. very small. That's amazing that they could detect those. Yes. And also that we can figure out what they ate and drank. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Not all herbivorous dinosaurs were fully herbivorous. Not all herbivorous animals in general are fully herbivorous. We talk about that a lot. Most aren't. Yeah. And in 2017, Karen Chin and others found that some herbivorous dinosaurs ate crustaceans. They found shells in 10 coprolite samples from Utah from about 75 million years ago. They could have been from hadrosaurs or ceratopsians based on the size of the coprolites. Hadrosaurs were the most common fossils in that area, like Parasaurolophus and Gryposaurus. Hadrosaurs could also crush and shear effectively. But ankylosaurid, nodosaurid, pachycephalosaurid, hypsilophodontid, and ceratopsian fossils have been found there. So it could be ceratopsians based on the area and the chewing. I remember that one at the time, and in my head, it's lodged in as a hadrosaur Mm -hmm. coprolite, but it's a good reminder that we're not really sure that it is from a hadrosaur. Yep. We actually covered it in two episodes. In the first one, we were talking about, it's probably a hadrosaur, and the second one, we're like, wait, nope, could be (laughs) ceratopsian. Either way, the dinosaur intentionally ate the crustaceans, and it seems like they were eating them in rotten wood. They were likely eating the wood to get at the crustaceans. Yeah, I remember there was like wood pulp (laughs) mixed in with the crustaceans. So they came up with this idea that there was like this rotting wood that had these crustaceans sort of eating the wood. And then the dinosaur was like, I need more calcium and like chewing through the wood and grabbing the crustaceans at the same time. Yeah, yeah, because exactly. They might have needed more calcium because it was mating season and they needed help making shells for their eggs. Or they just spotted them and they were like, I could eat that. (laughs) Always a possibility. That's true. (laughs) Think about that next time you're feeling peckish. Mm -hmm. It's also nice to have hands so that you don't have to eat a bunch of wood with your food. True. So like we said, it's hard to know what animals laid what coprolites because often they're not found together. And also coprolites can be fragmentary. I don't know if I've heard coprolites described as being laid before. That's pretty funny. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. In a dinosaur, it all comes out of the cloaca, so I guess the same verb applies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, paleontologists, though, have found bone in tyrannosaur coprolite. Or likely tyrannosaur coprolite, we should say, since we can't be sure. Well, they think it was probably Tyrannosaurus rex, because this coprolite was found in Saskatchewan, Canada, and it was about 1.5 feet or 0.45 meters long. So based on the size and where it was found, seems likely. And the fact that it had bone in it, I guess. Mm. In 2007, Karen Chin and others reported on dinosaurs eating wood. So that wasn't the crustaceans in the wood wasn't the first time of dinosaurs eating wood. In this case, they think that it came from Myasaura, the good mother lizard. This copper light was found in the two medicine formation in Montana. And they said it ate the wood intentionally because there were no twigs found. Conifer wood accounted for 13 to 85 percent of each copper light. This wood was also decaying. There's fungus, which possibly means that the fungus broke down the wood into something bioavailable, something that they could digest. Hmm. Even hadrosaurs with their grinding teeth and massive stomachs couldn't get much nutritional value from wood. So the fungus helped. At the time, they cited this as a potentially useful resource given the overall lack of grass and other angiosperms that modern herbivores prefer. I might be mixing up those two studies. This one where they were mostly eating wood and the other one where they were eating crustaceans. No, I think because we covered the one with crustaceans, our podcast was going at that point, but they cited the one about probably Myasaur eating wood. Gotcha. So they're linked. Don't worry. (laughs) But the moral of the story is it could be more than just hadrosaurs doing it. It could have also included ceratopsians and maybe even other herbivores that Mm -hmm. went after these crustaceans. Or wood. 
Yeah. <laughs> there was one Baptornis, a flightless aquatic bird, found with coprolites. The coprolites were about 0.4 inches or one centimeter in diameter, and they have the remains of a fish in them. So it ate fish. That was nice. We The coprolite was right next to the Baptornis. That's how they knew. At least probably knew. Yeah, probably knew. And it, it, like you said, it makes sense because we think the Baptornis ate fish. Mm-hmm. It's sort of a Hesperornis looking thing or penguin looking, maybe I should say. Yes. Coprolites have also been found near some Silosaurus fossils. And in this case, they had beetles in them and smaller invertebrates. There were so many that the animal that ate them was probably going after the beetles as prey. And the coprolites were relatively large, so they came from a medium-sized animal. The coprolites ranged from a little over 1 to a little over 2 inches or 31 to almost 55 millimeters long. They think the coprolites could be from Silosaurus because Silosaurus also had a beak that it could have used to peck small insects off the ground, like some modern birds. So it seems likely in terms of the size and the area and... Contents. Contents, yes. Uh, What's interesting is that at first Silosaurus was thought to be herbivorous, but this coprolite changed all that. Yeah, just like with the hadrosaurs and ceratopsians, like, oh, they're herbivores. And then you find a bunch of crustaceans that they might have eaten. You go, wait a second. (laughs) Guess it's not that simple. Pescatarians? (laughs) (laughs) Well, the crustaceans, I think, might have been land things. But I don't don't know what the term is for, I guess it'd be insectivorous. Mm. But we don't really apply that to humans. Right. So that's all I've got on trace fossils for dinosaurs until our fun fact. But first, the dinosaur of the day. So now on to our dinosaur of the day, Bihariosaurus, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was an ornithopod that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Romania. It was an iguanodon, similar to Camptosaurus. It looked like other ornithopods. It walked on two legs, had a bulky body, a long tail, and elongated head in paleo art, at least in the paleo art that I saw. It's unknown how big it was, and there's been no distinct features in its fossils found, and it looks like other ornithopods, so it's considered to be a nomonutum. The bone bed where it was found is mostly ornithopods. The type species is Bihariosaurus boxiticus, and the genus name means Bihor lizard. Bihor County is in Romania. It was named in 1989 by Florian Marinescu, who didn't describe it at the time, but did excavate by hand over 500 bones from the area where it was found between 1978 to 1979. That is a lot. And named Bihariosaurus based on material studied by Petrullius and others. Uh, he was, Florian was also part of that study. And in that study, they identified Hypsilophodon and Valdosaurus, Iguanodon and Vectosaurus in the bone assemblage. The fossils of Bihariosaurus that were found included the long bones of the hand, the metapodials, vertebral centra, and phalanges. Those are bones in the hand or feet. So not a whole lot to go on. (laughs) Just the very end of a limb or two and the middle of some vertebrae. Yes. I can see why you were saying in the paleo art they make it look this way because there's a lot of room for creative license with this dinosaur. Yes. Well, depends if you think this dinosaur is valid or not. That's true. But if it is an ornithopod, it was probably bulky with a long tail and a long head. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> that's pretty much how they looked. <laughs> and for our fun fact, I promised that it would be related to coprolites. Not only are there fossilized poop, coprolites, but there's also fossilized urine, known as urolites. Hmm. Urolites come from liquid waste expulsion into softer sediments. They've been found in Colorado, probably from sauropods. They've also been found in southeastern Brazil, dating back to the Cretaceous. They look similar to what ostriches leave. In tests, it looks similar to something formed by a, quote, abundant falling stream of fluid. (laughs) That's how the authors that described it wrote. This is Marcelo Fernandez and others. They described this in 2004. This liquid waste expulsion, it left a mark or a shape in the ground. And ornithopod and theropods have been found in that area, so it probably came from one of those dinosaurs. I imagine urine is a lot harder to 
figure out what left that than feces. Yeah. So there was in Colorado, they were from sauropods probably, and these are from Brazil where they probably came from a theropod or nithopod. Yes. I don't even know how you notice that this is a fossil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, as a bonus, there are even more trace fossils that came out of dinosaurs and other animals' bodies. They're known as bromelites, which you've referred to earlier, Garrett. Those are fossil food items that have been ingested or evacuated. <laughs> they can include coprolites, gut contents or cololites, and vomit or regurgitolites. I suppose they could count urolites. I'm not exactly sure where it falls into that definition. Yeah, yeah, that would definitely count. Usually, though, they don't even include the cololites and the regurgitolites. It's usually just like coprolites is what everybody's talking about. Mm -hmm. I think regurgitolites, the vomit, is the next most talked about. Yeah, especially because sometimes these animals are spitting out bones, sort of like an owl pellet. Yes. So there can be a lot of information in there, whereas like a urolite, not so much. Yes. And I think the cololites, like the actual fossilized gut contents are kind of rare. One thing, going back to coprolites real quick, you can see evidence of gas bubbles in them. Hmm. So many details. With vomit, there's a similar texture to coprolites, but they have a larger area and they're thinner. And they're also, they have partially digested material and evidence of liquid and etching. Uh, like you said, owl pellets are a type of regurgitolite. I guess if they fossilize, otherwise they're just a regurgitate. Oh, good point. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have the light rock suffix <laughs> if it hasn't been long enough. That's true. A Silosaurus may have also regurgitated pellets. Also, Anchiornis. There are six gastric pellets attributed to Anchiornis with these lightly etched lizard bones or fish scales. And regurgitating would have helped Anchiornis more efficiently digest its food. There are also possible troodon regurgitolites, which may mean troodon went after small prey. I feel like I learned a lot researching these trace fossils. And reviewing all our previous yes. <laughs> discussions of it. So thank you again, listeners, for supporting us and allowing us to do stuff like this. That wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. If you want to help support us so we can do more episodes like this, then head over to our Dino and All community at patreon.com slash inodino. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll get back into the swing of things with some regular dinosaur news. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.